Okay, so uh, I'd like to introduce Adam Cranfield, who's head of marketing for my news desk, and talk to us about uh, Brand Newsroom, the new model for PR Impact. Thank you very, very much. Afternoon, everyone. Um, okay, I just want to get a bit of a sense of uh, who you guys are. So, can you put your hands up for me if you work in marketing? Thank you. Can you put your hands up for me if you work in PR? Okay. Can you put your hands up for me if you didn't just put your hand up? What do you work in? Sales. Yep. Hands up if you work in sales. Okay. And anyone work in IT? Technology? Yep. Okay. It's about the audience. Sorry if I didn't include you in that, but hopefully this talk will still be interesting for you. So I mentioned marketing. I mentioned PR. Oh, by the way, let me just say that's me on Twitter. That's my news desk on Twitter. Uh, our stand's over that way. What is the difference between marketing and PR? Any thoughts on that? Well, this is one definition for you. Marketing is when I tell you I'm good in bed. PR is if someone else tells you I'm good in bed. We just think about that for a moment. Not, not going to be telling you those kind of stories at the moment, um, but you do have to give people good stories to tell if you work in the PR industry. That's what it's all about, and in marketing as well. It's all about trust. If you think about the brands that you love in your life, if you imagine a couple of brands that you really love, aren't they the brands that you trust most? You trust to deliver a good product, a good service. Can you put your hand up for me when you think about the company that you're representing here today, whether you are trusted as a brand? Put your hands up if you're trusted. Okay, that's great. And put your hands up if you're a little bit less trusted. Okay, a few brave souls, one or two, um, maybe honest. That's the challenge. This click is a bit strange. Um, what I wanted to it, tell you about is um, the Edelman Trust Barometer, a really interesting thing to check out online. Edelman, the big PR, industry, uh, big PR agency, every year they look at who we trust. Do we trust politicians, for example? Do we trust certain industries? Do we trust a person like me? Do we trust a professional like a doctor? And these, these are very interesting to track over time. Put your hands up again. Sorry, I'm asking you to do a lot of exercise today. If you work in technology, if your business is in technology, you guys are in an enviable position of actually being the most trusted industry sector at the moment. And anyone work in financial services at all? Okay. If you work in marketing or PR in financial services, you have the biggest challenge at the moment due to the low level of trust, rock bottom at the moment. But how much will that status um, continue? I don't know if this slide is familiar to any of you, but this is all the Edward Snowden leak, the, the data that's come from PRISM um, and the US uh, government, basically tracking all of, tracking all of the uh, major technology providers at a certain date. So this was um, Microsoft back in 2007. The US government started tapping into their data. Google 2009 going through to PayPal. Uh, to, to YouTube, to Skype, and uh, Apple were relatively late on board um, with PRISM only re revealing their data in uh, 2012. But issues like this may start to diminish our trust in the technology sector. Not related to PRISM, of course, but I decided to Google O2 data privacy, just as a little experiment, because in, in some ways our reputation today is made by what Google says. All of these search results were all on the first page of Google when I, when I checked um, a couple of months ago. Um, O2 admits it gives its users numbers to sites offering age-restricted content. O2 apologizes for security breach. Now, I've got nothing against O2. I, I love them. In fact, they're my mobile provider. But um, this is the kind of challenge that brands face. Um, and it wasn't surprised for me to hear that O2 have a quite a big um, content strategy at the moment around the whole theme of data privacy because I'm sure that one of their objectives is to try and change the way that the first page of Google looks for them at the moment on that topic. So we're talking about reputation. If you work in PR, that's particularly what you're interested in, but I would argue if you work in marketing and business, it's all about reputation. Things used to be a lot simpler. This guy here is Ivy Lee. Many people have called him the founder of the, of modern PR, in fact, and he was the inventor of the press release. What is a press release? Well, this is the first ever press release issued in 1906. 
Um, the interesting thing about this press release, which was in response to the Atlantic City rail disaster where 53 people died, um, it was issued by the Pennsylvania Railroad Company to defend their position. What's interesting is that it was published verbatim in the New York Times, um, and Ivy Lee issued that press release, and with that invented the idea of a company statement but it was a very different thing to what it is today because it was just simply published without changing a word in the New York Times and they got to set the story. Fast forward 100 years to 2006 and this blog post from the journalist Tom Foremsky, Die Press Release, Die Die Die, shows where we're at today with press releases. He wasn't happy with the way that PR people were using press releases and, and he felt that things needed to change. What he said sorry, was press releases are nearly useless. They typically start with a tremendous amount of topspin. They contain pat on the back phrases and meaningless quotes. What he was actually arguing for, and I do recommend you, you search for that die press release, die, die, die um, blog post, is a deconstruction of the press release. Because the idea of providing the raw information is important and good, but cut out all of the, the, the fluff and the spin give him the raw information that he needs, give him the components he can use to tell the story accurately in the way he wants to tell it. How many of you know this guy? Okay, it's Charles, if you work in technology, particularly important guy to know, he's Charles Arthur, he's the Guardian's technology editor, and he's um, very active in social media. He can often be seen um, online ranting about uh, approaches from PR agencies or PR individuals um, asking uh, you know, giving irrelevant pitches, for example, poorly titled emails um, and things like that, making his job as a journalist much harder than it should be. Um, but it's constructive criticism as well because I'm going to paraphrase him a bit here, but he has some useful words of advice. He says, be relevant. Obviously, everything in marketing is about relevance. Get your subject line right. Absolutely critical in a journalist's inbox of 500, 1,000 emails typically that they get every day if they're a good journalist. Don't use attachments. Build a relationship with the journalist. Include links and put this stuff on the web because he is going to research the story. He's not just going to do what the New York Times did in 1906 and publish your press release. It's all about how you tell your story why should Charles Arthur care about your company or your business or your product? And how do you sell it? How do you convince somebody that it's worth caring about? He has the cape, the mask, and that famous car. And though he may not be old enough to drive this custom-made Batmobile, today this five-year-old is teaching an entire city what it means to be a superhero. His name is Miles Scott, and while he's never fought crime, it turns out he knows a thing or two about putting up a good fight. He was diagnosed with leukemia at just 18 months. He's been battling it ever since. Well, today, he's in remission, and that seemed like a pretty good reason to celebrate. Hey, Miles! Your wish was to be Batman? Yeah. Why do you like Batman so much? Because he's my favorite superhero. What started out as a request to the Make-A-Wish Foundation turned into something far closer to a dream. The organization's request for volunteers snowballed on social media. Twitter caught fire. More than 10,000 people signed up. Even more showed up to transform San Francisco into Gotham City. And over several hours today, this adorable little guy lived out his enormous dream. He rescued this damsel in distress from the city's famed cable car tracks. He was summoned by the police chief. Bring the bat kid. There was even a bat signal. And with the citizens of Gotham cheering him on, Little Miles set off to save the San Francisco Giants mascot, Lucille, from the evil clutches of the felonious fiend, the Penguin. Nicely done, dynamic duo. You've saved the city. The San Francisco Chronicle printed a special edition, Bat Kid Save City. Five-year-old Miles even got a key to the city at a special ceremony. But the people here got something more. Today, they didn't leave their hearts in San Francisco. They gave them to a little boy who proved what it really means to be a superhero. Good job, Bat Kid. Bat Kid, hashtag Bat Kid. How many of you saw this story? 
Okay, about half of you. Um, it was all over mainstream media. BBC ran, ran uh, primetime news on it, CNN there, all the newspapers. And uh, the interesting thing about that story, which is kind of unsurpassable coverage for the um, Make-A-Wish Foundation, is that it was really amplified through social media. So this could have been a nice story, an interest, it's a great story, it could have been an interesting story, an interesting event, but the key to it was that what they did with social media in a short space of time. So the story came to me actually via Twitter, it broke for most people over social media, and then about a day or two later, the mainstream media picked up on the story and turned it into a completely mainstream story. Um, it, it was in San Francisco, so obviously when they're working in one of the most connected cities in the world with a concentration of very social media focused people. They were able to seed this story with 500 key influencers, 500 bloggers, um, and that made it amplify to celebrities. Barack Obama created a Vine video in response to this. The hashtag Backkid caught fire. Um, and this is kind of how, whatever you want to call this, marketing, PR, this is how this is, this is happening today and making a big difference. And, and the, the, I think the Make-A-Wish Foundation website just crashed. I mean, basically in terms of um, the, the publicity, it was absolutely incredible. So there are lots of different elements worth researching in the Backkid example. Um, how they seeded it. Um, what they did in real time in social media, the way they created a Twitter account for the Joker and they, they kind of were posting lots of videos and stuff like that. This has been termed by um, Edelman again, um, brand storytelling at the speed of social. And they've got a, a model for this. Um, PR agencies, PR teams, marketing teams, they need to restructure and think more like a publisher. And I've heard, I've just walking around today, I've heard quite a few people say this, this same point. Um, you need editors, you need writers, you need certainly video producers and creatives and, 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 and you need technologists in your team. You need social media people and, and you need community managers. You need them all to work together in real time in a social creative newsroom. This is from Edelman. The way I see it, um, it three big changes are happening um, in the world of communication. Real time, multi-channel, multimedia. If you get to grips with those three, then you're going you're gonna to lead your competition. This click is a bit of a nightmare. Um, so Oreo example. Hands up if you haven't seen the Oreo example. Okay, so I know it's a, it's a, it's a mainstay of all of these, these um, shows. So I'm just going to recap very briefly on it. This is when the lights went out in the Super Bowl, February. Oreo were able to produce the witty ad, you can, you can still dunk in the dark and put that out in the social media and got an incredible reaction at the time. And then just like the, the back kid one, the follow-up media coverage in the mainstream media they got was absolutely phenomenal. The bit that maybe fewer of you know is that they'd been practicing. This wasn't a one-off. They'd been doing something called the 100 Daily Twists to react to news stories and create a, um, a witty image and a witty caption. So Gay Pride, um, Tour de France, Ro uh, Mars rover landing, they were able to create these images and um, react in real time um, on social media and get a lot of, a lot of um, engagement through that. So when the unforeseen incident of the Super Bowl lights out happened, they were well set up to do another one of their 100 Daily Twists. The key thing in that is that an image is, is uh, the, the central point of the content. The becoming image obsessed, this type of thing, cat beards, um, it's quite mainstream whether you're a BuzzFeed fan or in fact I found this on the Daily Mail who are often taking inspiration from things like BuzzFeed. This type of content is what people are spending their, their days looking at. Things like pictures of hipsters taking pictures of food and other such um, amusing concepts, very meta that one. Um, sorry. Um, this is the most retweeted tweet of all time. When Barack Obama got in for his second term, um, this image was posted just seconds after that result was announced. 804,000 tweets that received, and it, sometimes a picture says everything you need to know. Mark Zuckerberg understands the power of images when he acquired Instagram for one billion dollars. And he was, sorry, he was thwarted in his attempts to acquire Snapchat for $3 billion recently. Uh, hands up if you don't know what Snapchat is. 
be honest. Okay. So basically, the image or the video、um, can only be watched once by the person you send it to. It disappears. So it's a sort of real-time, instant, one one-time、um, messaging for, for for video or images. And this is the future.、Uh, stories in the mainstream media、um, now have much more、uh, video content and image content. So. When BT Sport went up against、um, Sky Sports,、um, that was a very, very long web page, and it contains about 15 images, two videos,、um, a stock market chart, infographic, quotes, and these are all the elements. If you think back to Tom Fromsky's point, provide those elements and allow the journalist to construct the story. If you don't provide enough images and videos, the chances are they won't use the story. Things are moving. Oh, sorry. Things are moving incredibly fast at the moment, aren't they? Multi-channel is is the, is、um, absolutely key, and it's very very difficult to provide content in all of these different channels. I'm only I'm only showing a selection of them there. The way that we help at my news desk with this, and don't worry, it's not turning into a sales pitch, but we have the concept of a newsroom where companies can provide all of their news and content, and we also build a network around that newsroom or help you to do that. This is us as a company. We're about 150 people now, so that's not all of us. But、um, we, we're very, very customer focused at my news desk. This is how we communicate in our company on a on a closed Facebook group. That's our intranet, and it, I really recommend you try using this because it's such an effective form of communication. It's real time, it's multimedia, and it's very, very engaging. And it's good for the silly stuff as well as the serious stuff within a company. When we meet, we have Google Plus Hangouts. This is free and incredibly effective, and、um, this is our marketing team working together、um, on a project. And、uh, Google Plus makes it possible for us to connect across all of our Nordic countries and in, in Singapore, where we operate, and in Germany. This is our newsroom itself, which is the product we provide、um, for, for brands around the world. All of those little examples、um, were an attempt to show that technology changes communication, and a good example of that, sorry, is Dunbar's number.、Um, Dunbar, Robin Dunbar, is an evolutionary psychologist who tells us that we're only capable as humans of having a relationship with 150 people, any type of relationship, even a sort of a fairly fairly loose relationship. So. How do we square that with the number of accounts that I follow on Twitter? Nearly 2,000. I'm sure many of you also follow a lot of people. This is a new thing we're all as humans trying to deal with, having those kind of relationships. But technology changes the rules. Twitter enables us to have some kind of relationship that is beyond what we've ever experienced before. This wouldn't be a talk at the Digital Marketing Show if we didn't talk about big data. But I'm not really going to go into it too much. Um, one aspect of, of, of data that I want to highlight is that if you work in PR, you might have had your little black book,、uh, but now you have other opportunities. You can use influencer tools,、um, such as we do at my news desk, integrating clout into into our into our system, peer index and cred and others such like that, that will use algorithms to tell you who you need to be in touch with, rather than your trusted little black book. This is an example where, if you feed into my news desk, just simply a list of email contacts, that we're just scraping this data that's publicly available to tell you everything you would like to know about these individuals. So you can rank them by influence.、Um, this is Brian Solis coming up high up in the list, or Mike Butcher of TechCrunch, or Shell Holtz,、um, showing their influence, showing their, obviously their image, which certainly brings your list to life and enables you to know who you want to contact. Their subjects of interest as well. All that data, we are making available publicly. It just needs technology to pull it together and, and give you that insight. A little puzzle for you: Who can tell me what the question mark stands for here? Okay. Any search experts in the room? What do they have in common? Google. Yes, indeed. So Google Panda, Google Penguin, and Google Hummingbird. These are the major algorithm updates over the last couple of years, and what it means for content producers and SEO people and PR people. So the first one was Google Panda, which was a war on thin content. So no longer was it、um, a, a profitable strategy to have a, a layer of keyword content on your site without any depth to it, any actual、uh, useful content that, that real people actually want to consume. A lot of sites took a massive hit with, with Google Panda. 
Then came Google Penguin, which was largely, I'm very much simplifying, but largely a war on dodgy links. So no longer was it a good tactic to put lots and lots of content around lots of, again, sites that people don't visit and just link back to your own website. You, it's, but it's still very, very valuable to get links back from trusted websites that people do visit. Finally, very recently, we have Google Hummingbird, which is really a complete rethink of the whole way that search works for Google, and is a move towards a world where we'll just simply talk into our mobile phone and ask Google a question, like, is it going to rain in London tomorrow, and then follow up with, what about on Thursday, and then follow up with, how about in Edinburgh? Um, Google starts to understand what you mean. The three things to think about in regard to um, Google Hummingbird Think about your social signals. We're not really seeing huge results on this at the moment, but if you haven't got a plan for it, then you're going to suffer in the coming years. That Google is going to be paying a lot of attention to what kind of um, profile you have across social channels. Semantic search, I just touched on there, the meaning of your content. So stop thinking about keywords, start thinking about subjects, start thinking about becoming an expert on topics and use a richer variety of keywords because Google understands the connection between keywords and the language and the actual meaning behind it. And finally, I know you all know this already, but your sites need to be mobile optimized because if they're not mobile optimized at the moment and someone's particularly doing a search on a mobile phone, Google is smart enough to know that your search is on a mobile phone and it's not going to show you any sites that don't work well on mobiles. This is an example. Um, one of our clients is Panasonic, and it's a newsroom on the left that we do for Panasonic. It's the same web page on the right, but responsively designed means that when you look at it on your iPhone, um, it looks very, very useful, uh, sorry, usable, and Google um, is going to love that as well. When you do it right in PR, the results are fantastic. So a nice example I saw from Sweden um, was Lufthansa, who are basically offering people a new life in Berlin great competition where you could um, have, your, have a new home in Berlin, you could have everything paid for for a year or more. Um, there's one slight catch in the competition. You had to change your name to Klaus Heidi, a uh, very German name, um, and that was, that was the barrier to entry. The thing I wanted to highlight with this is that when you use the mobile um, app, or you just simply search online for this Lufthansa or Klaus Heidi or, or any of these, these keywords, you go straight through to a mobile site that works like an absolute dream and you can enter the competition in seconds. So the, camp the idea is great, but the execution is vitally important. When you get it wrong, um, here's an example from RBS, um, it can be quite amusing as well. Um, so <laughs> RBS have this RBS campaign. Um, they just sort of said, you know, search online for RBS um, to find out more about this. Um, the only problem was no one had checked that when you search for RBS, Google corrects that to rabies, um, and that was what was coming up as the first result on the page, a Wikipedia page on rabies. So again, it's the idea, but then the execution. Here's a really fantastic PR example from a company called PhoneBlock, so I'll just show the video for you. Every day we throw away millions of electronic devices because they get old and become worn out. But usually it's only one of the components that causes the problem. The rest of the device works fine but is needlessly thrown away. Simply because electronic devices are not designed to last. This makes electronic waste one of the fastest growing waste streams in the world. And our phone is one of the biggest causes. So this is a new kind of phone. It's made of blocks. Attachable blocks. They are all connected to the base, and the base connects everything together. Electrical signals are transferred through the pins, and two small screws lock everything in place. So if, for instance, your phone is getting a little slow, you can just upgrade the block that affects the speed. Or if something breaks, you can easily replace it with a new one, or update it with the latest version. Another great thing about this is, you can customize your phone. So let's say this is your phone, and you do everything in the cloud. Why not replace your storage block for a bigger battery block? If you're like this guy and love to take pictures, why not upgrade your camera? Or if you don't care about any of this stuff, you can keep it simple, and get a bigger speaker. You can choose the blocks you want, support the brands you like, 
or even develop your own blocks. PhoneBlocks is built on an open platform where companies work together to create the best phone in the world. To set up this platform, we need to get the right companies and the right people involved. They will only get started if there is a lot of interest in a phone worth keeping. So this is the plan. To show them there is an interest for this phone, we need your voice. You can donate your social reach on the website. We gather as much people as possible. On the 29th of October, we send out the blast, all at the same time. Spreading all your voices to show the world there is a need for a phone worth keeping. The more people involved, the bigger the impact. Please visit phoneblocks.com to raise your voice and spread the word. Phone blocks, a phone worth keeping. So a very interesting concept there, I think you'll agree. This is why I'm calling this a great PR example. Because in eight weeks, they managed to achieve 17 million YouTube views, 2,000 inbound links, many of those from high quality websites, but 900,000 people registered and did took, took uh, that call to action there. What they did was they basically used the, the Thunderclap app to create a social media explosion. Everyone who registered at that time, on the, on the 29th of October, um, this blast went out promoting phone blocks. What this resulted in was Motorola now working with phone blocks, which was basically only at the kind of Dragon's Den type stage of development, and Motorola is owned, owned by Google. So what an incredible example of how you can use content and then seed it. I'm just going to give you a little example of um, something that, b believe it or not, HMRC, our tax man, said. Um, this is one of our clients in, uh, at my news desk. He said that you need to find your porn, you need to find the thing that your customers or your audience are interested in. And for HMRC, it's mugshots of tax offenders and, and smugglers. And this is their whole PR strategy based around that, whatever it might be for your industry. We, I'm just going to wrap up now with this because I was starting about five minutes late, didn't I? So basically, um, we are in the newsroom business. So what we did is we looked at the world's top 100 global brands. And we looked at how they're running their newsroom presence. And we evaluated that on a number of different criteria. And I'll do this quickly in the format of my news desk 10 commandments. The first one is thou shalt build your network. We found the world's top 100 global brands 70% of them didn't provide an option to subscribe to email updates from their newsroom. Thou shalt optimize for search. 25% of them failed to rank on page one of Google for the search term, their brand name, plus the word news. Thou shalt be open to communicating. 45% of them failed to include contact details on their press releases. 24% failed to list a phone number for a representative. Thou shalt not only communicate with journalists. If you are not a member of the press, you will not receive a response, was the friendly message on Google's newsroom. 22% didn't provide any added value content. Thou shalt help people find stuff. 39% lacked a search function in their newsroom. Thou shalt take pride in your newsroom. 35% failed to keep their newsroom up to date. Thou shalt think visually. 40% didn't even have a basic image library. Thou shalt make movies. 49% didn't feature video content in their newsroom at all. And these are the world's top 100 brands. Thou shalt be social. 45% didn't link to social networks from their newsroom either. Finally, thou shalt tell your story. Hard one to quantify this, so I'm just going to leave you with a quote and a recommendation to check out a TED Talk by Andrew Stanton of Pixar, the man behind such great stories as Toy Story and Wall-E. The quote that I particularly like from his talk is this one. Make me care, please. Emotionally, intellectually, aesthetically, just make me care. And if you bear that in mind as a communicator, you won't go far wrong. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. We are running a bit short of time. Adam's on stand 22, so uh, feel free. Are there any quick questions before we move on? 
Okay, well, thanks, Adam. Thank As I say, stand 22 if you do want to follow up on any of those points. Thank you. Thank you.